continue, please. Sorry. <laughs> oh, so we were talking about the game and, and this, um, this documentary series uh, called, I think it was uh, pertaining to the Danbury Thrashers in the United Hockey League. We were talking about just the difference in, uh, in, in, in the game and how far it's come. Obviously it's much more of a skill game than it ever has been. We value speed, we value, um, you know, skill, finesse, et cetera, but there's still a rough part of the game and there's still, you know, it's a very emotional game and there's still areas where there's, there's fighting involved and, and there are ter- different people on the, on the, on the side of, of, Hey, you know, this is bad for the sport. And there's people that say, Hey, you know, this is part of the game. This keeps players honest. I seem to fall somewhere in the middle. I, I think it's at times uh, it keeps players honest, but having said that we were talking about, you know, the early two thousands, this was a totally different time guys. Like you had guys that in the minor league. So considered like triple a and double a baseball where, these guys were literally paid and their job was, you know, one dimensional. Let me put it that way. Um, <laughs> I had a, um, uh, there was a, again, we were alluding to this docu-series. His name was Brad Wingfield. T- tough as nails. Like I'm talking like, but he loved, he loved fighting. Like that's, that's what he did. Um, the crazy part, I, I had a, a, a very short cup of coffee with him at a training camp that I got released from. But just in my my small time with him, like he's the kind of guy, though, that you'd almost let he's just a, a great guy. Like you let him. Da- I don't have a sister, but you almost let him date your sister. But when he got on the ice, it was a very different human being and very non-emotional about it. He knew his job, loved it. Um, and believe it or not, back in those days, the early 2000s, late 90s, there's guys that loved it as well. Um, um, you know, that was their that was their there was their job. Um I think we're seeing a lot of, of the repercussions of that now from head injuries and, and, um, and, and the game has changed uh, considerably, which I think is good. I, I mean, you don't have four or five guys like that on a roster anymore. Um, you have guys maybe on the third or fourth line that are, you know, can score 10, 15 goals a year, but aren't afraid to drop them either. Um, so it's a different game, um, but it, uh, it's a very emotional sport. Nonetheless. Can I show my ignorance? Though, is it right that the the unspoken rules about fighting in hockey is like, if you have two guys that fight, everybody lets them get on with it. Yep. What what happens after that? Because obviously in rugby, you're going to get cited, you're going to get a several yeah. match ban, like all that kind of stuff. Yeah, typically that happens, right? Most of the time you're dealing with guys that, <clears throat> again, are, are, are that, that was their job back in the day. Um, and typically there'll be a conversation, you know, hey, care uh, off, off the get go. Let's go. Let's get her going. You know, let's let's go. And that might be your job as well. You might just give me a nod or or there might be a, you know, hey, you know, I'm injured. Uh, I can't I, I hurt my hand. I can't go. Um, but there's also that emotional aspect, right, where, um, um, you know, perhaps a, a player's a, a very skilled player uh, has taken liberty on you or on a teammate. And, 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 you know, there's a message that needs to be sent in those, in those instances. Again, I'm not condoning that, <clears throat> excuse yeah. me, but the emotive part of that game. And uh, uh, back in those days, again, that was, that was your job. You yeah. know, like, you know, you you need to, you need to make sure that, that, uh, you know, you, you tighten it up a bit and uh, someone's taking a Liberty on your star player and there's going to be a message sent. Um, um. Yeah, I was going to say, like, I'm not sure if Keeney have seen it. I'm sure, Anthony, you've seen it. That famous video. I'm just going to go on a limb here and say some sort of final. I want to say Stanley Cup final because I'm, I'm amazed about how much hockey I actually know talking about you, uh, with, with you. But when they start the game, like, out of nowhere, it's just the one team goes, gloves off, like, 5v5, and the other coach, like, with the, with the top-end team just goes furious because now they're all in the bin. Or yep. it's just the tactic from the get-go. It just goes, whistle. 10 people yep. gloves down and you're like, is this really how the game is going to start? And yep. uh, the guy from the, um, this documentary, the, the ice guardians, I just Googled it. He was talking about like, you know, Wayne Gretzky in part being Wayne Gretzky because he had someone taking care of his back, you know, like yep. hitting everyone else so he could play and, and that sort of role and how sport has evolved into like, like you say, like a more civilized and like code based, but there's still some sort of like culture yep. on it. Like, how does it work? No doubt. I mean, there's still, the, the, again, it's not the, the one dimensionality like it was in the past, right? Players can play. Um, they're not there tripping over their knuckles. Um, I mean, it's, you, you got guys that can play the game at high levels, but, you know, if those moments occur, um, you've got guys that are more than willing to take part 
Um, again, typically that happens, um, you know, someone uh, uh, hits somebody or star player with a cheap shot. Uh, there might be retribution. It might be, you know, it might not be that day. It, it might be two nights, the next, you know, you got, you got a game the next day back to back. <laughs> You're probably sleeping. You're not sleeping well that night. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's, it's just an emotional game and it's a very, very fast game. Um, and, um, you know, it, it's, like I said, people love it or hate it. I, I fall somewhere in the middle. I don't think it's, I don't think it should be, a, uh, you know, I don't think it should be banned. Uh, but at the same time, you know, the play of, of yesteryear or yesterday, uh, in the, in the late nineties and two thousands, uh, I'm glad it's cleaned up. It's interesting that you have, you know, such youth participation considering that when you have the struggles of rugby and football where you know oh i'm worried about this i'm worried about that but then you know a sport with like out and out fighting is like that's where all the kids are going yeah uh yeah i don't know if it would be you know i think it's you know i'm biased of course we talked about this it's It's an exciting game you know it's it's an exciting game you move you know you move at fast speeds um, you know, the NHL now is starting to saturate markets that have never ha- have never been exposed before. Out west, uh, um, you know, L.A., uh, the Anaheim Ducks. We were talking off air. Las Vegas, Seattle. I mean, these are places where hockey's starting to grow, and people are saying, "Man, that's kind of a cool sport. I want to get involved." Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't think you know. I think in maybe in certain markets, in, in uneducated markets, that fighting might draw the attention of, of, of fans. But I think the more refined you are in terms of your acumen of the sport, I think you're in there for, Hey man, this is a beautiful game. Let's get involved. See if the kids like it. If not, we can always play a different sport, but let's try it out. Um, I think a lot of that has to do with the NHL and, and, and getting more people involved in the game for young kids. Well, actually, I, I think the, the same thing has happened in the UFC. It, the, the, the taste of the audience is almost yep. evolved. Yep. Um, but anyway, training. So, yeah. if, if I remember correctly, from the first time we spoke, your your dad was born in Serbia yep. to uh, Russian parents, correct? And you were born. Correct. In- yeah. My the Serbian sensation. My my boy. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, this. Yes. My father was my my my. So my my dedishko, which is grandfather in Russian, was born in, in Russia. Uh, yeah. Moscow. My babushka was born in Serbia, Belgrade, okay. and uh, raised in Belgrade. It was war torn in the time, um, and uh, they 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 wanted to to try to leave. Uh, it was dangerous. Um, this was like the middle of of uh, Nazi Germany, etc. And uh, at the time, I'll never forget. My dad relayed some stories to me, and you know they were literally like playing soccer, and bombs were going off. And long story short, they wanted to try to to immigrate and they lived three years in a refugee camp uh, in Trieste, Italy. Uh, man, I, I saw pictures. Uh, I'm proud of my, my dad's, my dad's history. Just uh, I lost my dad recently and to be able to reflect uh, it, it gets me kind of emotional, but um, yeah, they lived at three years in Trieste, Italy. Um, they were sponsored by a church uh, and came over in a boat pier 21 in Halifax, Nova Scotia and, um, in uh, May 17th, 1954, my dad was 12 years old, not a dime in, his, uh, in their pockets and no language. Their university degrees, my, my, my dedishka at the time, my grandfather was a, an engineer. Uh, those degrees weren't looked at with anything. You started over, essentially. Um, church sponsored. And, and you know, uh, my dad uh, was a survivor. Uh, uh, he, he thrived in, in, in working hard. Um, and having responsibilities and, and, and commitments. And uh, hopefully, you know, I, I say this in passing, but I hope I hope uh, I picked up one tenth of, 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 of the, the character that he has over, over my life, hopefully. Uh, but it's an interesting story, nonetheless. Long, long journey for my father. Incredible. Yeah. So, I mean, with Serbia, Russia, you know, you you certainly in the uk and i think to an extent in america when you when you're in sport there's this aura of mystique around kind of like central and eastern europe of of sport preparation do you have any hint of that with you know considering who your family was when you came up as an athlete great question uh yes and no uh it didn't have to do with my father's background at the time it just had to do with my early 
resources that I delved into at a, at a young age regarding strength training. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the, the West Side Barbell uh, manuals that were, uh, you know, by, uh, and I'm mispronouncing names, uh, Medvedev uh, or uh, Matvedev, excuse me. Yeah. Um, uh, the text there that they sold uh, got me really interested. There was a, a very, very famous Russian hockey coach, um, uh, Tarasov. Uh, who did a lot of off ice uh, conditioning and that was kind of out of the box at the time. Um, so I just followed it with passion, uh, always knowing that, uh, you know, back in those days, that was the information to be garnered and learn from, you know. Um, so, yeah, it drove me there. <clears throat> Talk to me about your your book. So, I mean, I'm, I'll, I'll plug uh, it. The, the, the book is excellent. The book is excellent. And I'm, I'm actually embarrassed. It took me that long to read it. But one of the things that struck me about that book, so is it's gain, grow, go. Or is it yep. the other way around? Yeah. Gain, go, grow. Yeah. Gain, go, grow. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Just Lift something research. heavy. <laughs> Lift something heavy. Lift something for reps. Move something fast. Yep. And I had actually arrived at a similar um, kind of like organization, organization of the week in season, but just switching the, the grow and the, the game days. And it always encourages me if you have two people in complete isolation that they arrive at the same solution because then you know, you, you know I'm not copying or I'm not you know, picking this up because of the guy's reputation. So how did you arrive at that? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, uh, several people that I hold in high esteem, I, I read about and then kind of absorbed, modified and apply that information that we called him the Serbian sensation, Miladin Jovanovic. He recommended oh, yeah. a couple books to me. Uh, if you, if you, if you haven't read them, they're fantastic. Um, Gerd Gigerenser, uh, risk savvy and gut feelings. Uh, and it talked about this idea of, of, you know, how to make decisions in a, in a very uncertain world. Um, and Gerd, to give you a footnote version, was a big fan of heuristics, rules of thumb. We know this uh, all, all the time. He talked about these worlds. He talked about three worlds for, for me. He talked about the world of certainty, which doesn't exist, you know, maybe paying taxes and death. Um, the world of, of risk or probability, you know, you're playing the, the slot machine and the world of uncertainty, which we live in. And he said, you can make two major mistakes in those worlds. You have the zero risk. Uh, uh, illusion, which is when you mistake the world of, of, of certainty with risk, right? Hey, I, I can drink my whole life and I'm never going to get, uh, you know, liver cancer. Well, that's a zero risk illusion. And you can mistake the world of uh, probability with the world of uncertainty, uh, which we call the turkey illusion, you know, 364 days a year, the turkey's a happy guy. And, and, and guess what? On Thanksgiving Day, his fucking head's cut off. <laughs> <laughs> and he talked about these heuristics in, in, in difficult circumstances and uncertainty. And, and he, he talked about uh, an uncertain world such as investing. And he talked about this one divided by N heuristic, which is essentially diversifying your portfolio, right? Yeah. Some of the best in the world um, uh, um, do that and, 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 and seek favorable returns more so than these, you know, these, the, these, these very difficult um, computer algorithms, et cetera, that they put into the system based on past events. We're always good at it. But there was a guy, he literally won a Nobel in economics. Yes. He retired and then he's like, no, I'm good. One over in. Yeah. He wouldn't <laughs> even live his own uh, Nobel prize because That's, of what you're about to say. It, exactly. Well, it, again, it's this idea of, 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 hey, you know, we're really good at, 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 at figuring out past events because there's no uncertainty in the future. The problem with using past materials is that there's a lot of noise. And I think when you put in these fancy algorithms, you, you're dealing with, you don't know what's noise and what's not. And, and Gerd would say, hey, listen, let's just create some simple heuristics, one divided by N, divide out your portfolio. And I thought, shit, well, you know, maybe I should do that with training and stress. You know, I want to lift something heavy in my micro cycle in my week. I want to lift something real fast and focus on that. And then potentially I want to, I want to lift something for time or for capacity sake. So I want to diversify that stress portfolio. So that's how I thought of that. And I got that. And then the other idea was um, a gentleman that uh, no, no, needs no introduction. You know, although I've never met him face to face, I've spoken to him on the, the phone many times before. And he's just a dear person and a brilliant guy is Dan Fath. And this idea of this three day rollover program. I mean, there's. I said in the book, it's gain, go, grow is nothing. I mean, I just use it for a, a, a way to, for a really quick catchphrase for our athletes to know what they're focusing on that day. It's not reinvented. I just absorbed, modified, and applied that knowledge and then tried to use it 
Um, and you know, that's debatable too, Kara. Is it a hockey specific program? I try to, I try to relate it to the game of hockey. Um, and I try to relate it based on the biomechanics, the energy system, et cetera, and then create that micro cycle with that one divided by an heuristic, a three day rollover program. The other thing, uh, in the program itself for me, which is an aha moment. Um, and this is more for our advanced level athletes is this idea a heuristic of like horsepower dictates, you know, uh, your, 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 your frequency. And, uh, again, from FAF and FAF and Boo Schexnader, you know, essentially elite athletes or athletes that have higher training ages, they need to, they need higher stress to solicit, you know, an adaptation that comes at a cost. Coupled with the fact, and this is arguable for a lot of people, coupled with the fact that I, I start to consider myself as I've aged less and less important for elite athletes, right? Like you want to get good at playing the guitar, play the damn guitar. Mm -hmm. uh, your, your energy should be spent playing the guitar, not, you know, slamming weights. So it was a, it was a deal where, okay, if we need to stress the athlete more and, and have, you know, more intensity, well, we need to st structure rest. We also need to uh, look at frequency in a matter of like, you know, what's competing here. Yeah. I, I condone, I don't condone, uh, you know, year round conditioning or year round playing, but I also, uh, um, I also realize that if you want to get better at a sport, you got to focus on the skills of your sport, target context, target environment, and we're quick in strength and conditioning. And I'm one of them to hockey people. Oh, you know, this, this, and this correlate with speed and, and, and power on the ice. Great. Great. That's, that's fine. We have that in our week, but like there's other elements to skating. Like there's read and reacting, there's edge work, there's change of direction, there's shooting, there's stick handling, uh, there's, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, you name it. There's just so many levels and layers where I thought, you know, the guys are going to be working on this in the summer. Uh, we need to take a step away and, and, and have less frequency in the weight room and focus on what matters most, which, again, you start from the scoreboard and work backwards. So it was a, it was a combination of all those things that kind of, you know, created this game, go grow thought. Did you have to iterate over time or did oh, it come out fairly fully formed? Oh, oh yeah. And we still do. Yep. We still do. Um, we, we started, uh, we, we tried to get an idea of, of, you know, what was most stressful on the athlete with trim scores and tried to, you know, where we would order the days, you know, we started a, a game, a game day or a max effort day, uh, on a, on a, on a Monday, as opposed to in the past was a speed day on a Monday. And the reason being is, you know, uh, the guys probably had a lot of fun on the weekends. You know what I mean? And I'd, I'd rather have a slow contraction or a high CNS day with speed midweek uh, than, than, than the front of the week. Um, the, 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 get, the, the grow day was more of a work capacity day, which we wanted uh, at the tail end of the week. So we give the athletes 48 to 72 hours to recover from. That's what um, so that, you from, right? Yeah. And, and, uh, and that, that uh, grow day was more time-based, believe it or not. It's, it's, yeah. You can sit it, consider it a repeat effort method, but mm. it was, uh, I stole the idea from, a uh, um, Parkinson's law, you know, like the more time you're going to have to do something, the more time you're going to take to do it. Right. Yeah. If you're a retired guy that has nothing to do, you might take the whole afternoon to, to mail, to mail a postcard to your buddy. Um, you know, if you're a busy guy like yourself, you, you're going to make that quick and you're going to get it done quick. I say, I wouldn't say busy. I'm, I'm yeah. active, active, <laughs> active. I, I got it. But so we, we, we do things for time, work capacity days. Um, and knowing all well that, um, you know, um, it's not a perfect program. There'll be iterations over time. We use our error eliminators, our, 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 you know, what we measure each, uh, each mesocycle or excuse me, microcycle fancy word for weekly, obviously for the training groups. Um, and then we kind of, we see where things need to be tampered with. And it's, they're not like major overhauls. Um, you know, it might be uh, a different, uh, um, you know, our game go grow. Um, our, our gain day would be more max effort. We'd have more higher impulse plyos. Our, our go day stretch shortening cycle plyos. Our, our grow day more uh, frontal plane plyos with more impulse. And depending on uh, on some of the, the the information that we garner, we might change up uh, the focus. Uh, we might have more stretch shortening cycle days. Guys that are that we need to, you know more stiffness from, more speed from. Um, but small iterations over time. Um, but I. I I'm a believer as athletes age, you know, the more and more important it is when I say athletes age, maybe re rephrase this, you know, six, seven years in a, in a, in a, in a um, progressive resistance program, you're, you're playing at a high level of hockey at college or professional. I mean, 
you, you want to get good at playing up. You want to get it great at the game. You got to, you got to focus on the game and you got to focus on the skills of the game. Um, and I think we, as a, we, I, I'll point myself in the summer is I think we can get a lot done in three days and we can have enough time to focus on what matters most in the other two, which is skill work possibly in the ice, not conditioning, not mindless repetition stuff. I'm just talking skill work on the ice. And then as the season progresses, the, the off season progresses, they might even see me twice a week on the ice because they're picking up their skill work, getting ready for training camp. Um, you know, you can look at a lot of research on, on, on VO2 and VO2 on the ice. It's, it's, they're very different. Um, one's more efficient. One's more, uh, and you can look at uh, um, um, some research uh, talking about aerobic adaptations on the ice and this, this idea that what happens inside the muscle may be more, more important than the central adaptations. You know, there's a reason Lance Armstrong finished 768th at the Boston Marathon. He wasn't conditioned to run. He's got a great VO2. You know, you, you hear guys all the time, man, I, shit, I need to get my skating legs back. Give me, get my skating legs back. You can condition on the bike all you want. You can do your tempo runs. You can do your sprints. That's all fine and dandy, but it's a different beast when you get on like the, the, I was going to ask you some questions about the biomechanics of, of skating. Do you yeah. think there's like a degree of hypoxia associated with skating that's not there in other activities that are more kind of like have that stretch shortening cycle? Component? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, I don't have, I mean, my gut tells me it does, right? If you look at the contraction profile, um, you're, you're held in a, you know, you're, you have a stance and swing phase, you're in double leg glide, which is essentially quasi isometric holds for quads and hamstrings. Um, and that loads you up for a very short lived uh, extension of the quads uh, during propulsion. So, yeah, I would think that th that that byproduct that would build up, uh, uh, you know, a little bit more uh, uh, rapidly than 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 it would otherwise in another sport uh, because of that position. Again, I have no research on that, but um, it, it's it's nonetheless interesting. Uh, uh, the differences that they're, they're not like massive differences. Like uh, I talked to Dan Faff about this, like for me, for me, I try to build out some rules of thumb for biomechanics. Um, um, as so we are talking about this idea from run to glide. So almost like starting out of the blocks in sprinting, yeah. um, run to glide is approximately the first, first five to eight steps, right? This is, this is literally from standing still. So you got to create friction in almost a near frictionless environment. Yeah. Um, you do so by, by creating angles with the blades relative to the ice. You got, you know, propulsive angles. You do so by um, step width, really stepping out wide and trying to dig into the ice. Um, and then after those five to seven, uh, or uh, excuse me, five to eight steps, uh, you know, you go into your glide phase where, you know, joint amplitude increases. You got to get low to fight the air resistance. One of the big differences in sprinting is trunk segmental air, uh, angle, right? The, 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 the angle of the trunk relative to, the, to the, the, uh, the horizon. You know, obviously in sprinting, top end speed, and you know way more about this than I. I don't claim to, but I know essentially you're going to get vertical, right? I mean, yeah, top end sprinting. That, yeah. yeah, you can't do that in hockey. You, you completely slow yourself down, right? What, two of the things that we have to fight against as hockey players are air resistance and friction from the ice, which air resistance is going to be the biggest. So you got to keep a low, low trunk segmental angle. You have to keep a deep, deep knee bend. Um, deeper you bend your knees, the longer you have on your stride, stride length. So there are some heuristics that are similar, uh, very similar to sprinting, right? Um, number of, uh, as speed increases, um, uh, glide time, believe it or not, increases, right? From run to glide. Um, in sprinting, believe it or not, a difference might be as, 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 as speed increases, ground contact time decreases in sprint. Believe it or not, and again, this very limited biomechanical research in hockey, force transducers on the skate would tell you otherwise for top end speed. You have actually more time from run to glide on the ice than you would. Um, um, so it's, it's different. Uh, but angles of the trunk are going to be a little bit different. Uh, stride rate, stride frequency pick up. Um, during top end speed, um, but the drivers and the and the brakes are a little bit different, right? So our drivers in hockey, again, if we're keeping that low low position on the ice, are, are traditionally going to be um, our quads and our glutes, right? External rotator uh, and abduction of the glutes; those are huge drivers for us. So think about striding out and and, and uh, on the ice. As simultaneously, our brakes typically in, in sprinting would be hamstrings, right? I can tell you this right now. I don't want to say never because 
I've seen them very, very rarely. Very rarely are you going to see a guy or a girl in hockey have a hamstring injury. Very rare. Yeah, a ton of groins, though. Yeah, you're gonna you're, the groin's gonna be the king of the kings, right? So you you've got a high contraction, fast movement, and you're relying on the adductor and adductor magnus to put on the brakes. So is it an overhaul where you would call it a hockey specific program? No, but I do think they're they're if you know the mechanics of your sport, you know the buckets that you want to fill and what not to fill, and you know that work some areas that you want to target. In the off season, I think that makes it a much more specific program of the sport. Question for you about the, um, you know, the the surface that you're playing on. Like one of yep. the, again, it's it's very fashionable from say like 15 years ago, this idea of adding instability to to movement, and there, there's been a couple of uh, a couple of people say, oh. When you compete on an unstable surface, train on an unstable surface. One of the uh, personal beliefs that I have about, you know, the court and field-based sports is that actually there is a ton of instability in those sports, but it's not coming from the feet. It's coming from everything that's happening up here. People are pushing you, pulling you, you have an implement and so on. But I guess ice would strike me as somewhere in the middle. Yeah, that's a, that's a, I, I would not feel stable at all on ice. So is there, is there a component that you, you introduce of instability into training or is it just that already such masterful skaters that it's not necessary? That's a fantastic question. I don't know if I'm going to answer that well and I'll do my best, right? So I think there's a big difference um, between walking on ice and skating on ice, right? So let's look at it from a standpoint of you and I right now just walking on ice. Like I would probably shimmy like I'm walking on the ocean, not wanting to cut my feet. And without trying, this is again, my, my, this is my hypothesis is when you do that, right. You almost have drivers and brakes simultaneously co-contracting, right? Like you're, you're, you're moving, you're moving, you're moving on an unstable surface like that. Right. Yeah. Um, you can't move very well like that because when, when, when the driver's not being inhibited, you can't, you can't move. Right. Like, so, so. I would think that's very different on the ice. Like, right. When you propulse on the ice, you've got a small blade. Um, it is kind of like locomotion on the ice. You see, you know, towards the end, hamstrings being inhibited, quads being driven. Um, so I think it's different uh, walking than obviously than skating on the ice. So I don't think for us, I'm not a big unstable surface person unless I'm coming back from a rehab where I want uh, yeah. the aforementioned qualities. Uh, right, that, that re-education. Exactly, so exactly. Yeah. Now, having said that, there are, we talked about this and I, I, you know, this idea of coefficient of friction, you know, essentially the pressure between surfaces moving over one another, right? And it's minimal on the ice based, you know, comparatively speaking to, to court-based sports. Um, can we train that off the ice? Never like we would on the ice, but there are some, uh, there are some tools that we can use. Uh, we may use flex discs, which essentially like, like a little, like a little, um, uh, gosh, a little donut on wheels. Yep. We might use some things like that. Um, so we obviously slide boards. And when I say slide boards, um, based on a lot of the kids' volumes of skating, I, we may not slide board in the summer uh, just for slide board purposes. We, but we may use them for growing work um, once we, you know, to, to focus on tissues. Um, so, yeah, not the unstable stuff like a one legged BOSU ball, nothing like that but unstable in the fact that there's less coefficient of friction. We're trying to mimic um, focusing on brakes and drivers in, in this case, really the AD doctor, AD doctor Magnus area. Yep. Oh, so, I mean, if we, uh, if we kind of tra- uh, change to uh, business, ask yep. you a couple of questions about oh, business. Shit. Hopefully I can do that. You're the, you're the man. You, no, you, no, every no. time I talk to you, I, I, you I, I, uh... I, feel, I don't, I, I don't feel too bright. <laughs> oh no absolutely not not me i mean is it you you work with your brother right i do um how do you thread that needle i'm curious say, say it again i'm sorry how do you thread that needle tough man um and and not not in a bad way uh i have two brothers i have an older brother uh nisha and i have a younger brother matt uh both my best friends come from an extremely close family so my, my pals my best friends uh love them to death but yeah there's certainly times that uh you know it can pose to be difficult, you know, when, when you have difficult discussions, sometimes it's easier to, to talk with a, not a stranger, but a coworker than it would be to have difficult conversations with your brother. 
Um, yeah. but, but at the end of the day, um, life is short. And, and uh, when I'm being able to, to work in an environment with my best friend, that's special. So uh, the, the pros far outweigh the cons. Um, he's a fantastic uh, 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 strength coach, uh, and, but he, he runs the majority of the business sector of what we do. Um, so, I mean, he's, he's brought a ton, a ton to our business, but, uh, yeah, like, like anything else, uh, in, in working a family business, there are some rocky times, but certainly the, the reward much, much, much greater than any kind of, uh, any kind of drawback. Do you feel that you guys have, have settled on like a, a winning formula? Because obviously, yeah, I forget who I, uh, who I was talking to, but it, it seems to be one of these traps for strength and conditioning coaches in the private sector where you're, you, you start work, you start work, you bring in more business, you're spending more and more hours with the clients delivering the product or service and you never uh, create that time to work on the system, not in the system. And then you have the pain of actually having to say no or pare it down Yep. But it would strike me that when you have a partner in that regard, there's not that conflict. I agreed. I think the challenge for us as a small business, and I can speak from my experience, is scalability. Um, we have two. We have we have a staff, including my brother and I, have two additional coaches, great coaches, um, young coaches. Um, we have a, approximately a you know at on a good day a 3,500 square foot facility, right? Um, yep. Which at times is way too small. But at times you're like, wow, we got just enough. We have plenty of space. You know, uh, our summers from essentially, you know, um, uh, April to August, we're we're moving. Like we're moving. A lot it's of hockey like, players. Feast and famine in, in in you know like the the private sector. Yep. I, yep. You know, Exos Exos is empty. 10 months a year. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's a, it's a big challenge. When I talk about scalability, though, it's like, you know, we've gone over this many times before. Like, do, do we invest in a 6,000 square foot facility? Like, let's, let's do this because we, we can grow. We can do this. We can do that. The question becomes, you know, are you paying double the overhead yeah. to, 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 to essentially make the same or maybe just a little bit more with double the headache? Do you know what I mean? Um, so it's, it's not electricity and yeah, everything, um, coupled with the fact this is a tough one here. I don't know how it is in any other state, but this is a, actually a brilliant business idea, but that's affected us and affected all businesses in, in Ohio. So what's happened now, and I won't mention companies, but what's happening is there may be university affiliated, uh, uh schools, um, or, uh, big hospitals, and in Ohio, so let's hypothetical situation here. You're a principal at a school in Columbus, Ohio. And our hockey team at one point trained with you. Okay. They trained at Don Scott Strength and Conditioning. They say, hey, Kier, um, listen, we've got an awesome, awesome uh, uh, staff here at University of whatever. Um, we'd, like to, we'd like to price quote you on strength and conditioning. And they're going to come up because we've heard these pitches before with a, a price that you're just like, you can't, you can't not take. It's almost for free, right? Yeah. And it, it's, it's a lost. It's a, it's. I don't want to. I don't know what the how to use the word, but essentially, it's a, it's a lost expense. Meaning, what happens when Tommy goes down with an ACL injury? Mm-hmm. They're going to make it up in one surgery because it's a full service solution, right? They get their PTs, their doctors, etc., all involved. So yeah. it, it's a lost soldier. Meaning. They're, they're gonna they're gonna pay the strength coaches whatever they get paid um, but they're making up for it in hopes of like we have model. yeah exactly and 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 what we've seen from a, an athlete standpoint in the last several years at least with our, our high school athletes is, is a massive impact um, you know uh, in terms and measures of uh, of uh, of the numbers that we used to have and that includes hockey players I mean I'd like to say that we do things well here. I'd like to say, of course, being having a bias that we, we do it great. But at the end of the day, if you, if you don't have an educated, um, if, the, if, the, if the, the end user, which is the parent, doesn't know one from the other. We have the same thing. Like you have, <laughs> you have to train your clients how to consume the product. 100%. And, and in this case, like uh, it's so important uh, you can you can you can create awesome relationships with the kids 
which is fantastic. At the end of the day, you have to also educate the parent. And, um, and that's a challenge. Uh, you know, uh, it's been a challenge. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's certainly a two-way street, uh, but, you know, uh, in, in Ohio, like I said, with this model, it, it's definitely, it definitely affects small businesses, um, more adults than we've ever had, um, which is good. Um, our, our, our older groups, our pro groups are, are, are still, uh, are still a, a pretty big cog during the summers and, and our younger athletes that, that have not yet been in high school, maybe, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're, uh, we're, we're potentially marketing to more. Make sense? Yeah. I mean, you you mentioned scale how do you how do you you know you can you can tell me no obviously because this, this is yeah. like a bit but like how do you build that scale in because my my outsider's impression is that you do a very very good job with scale and staff training and making sure that you know no matter who is in front of the the athletes it's the same product same service so how do you how do you go about that great question um uh, because of COVID, it's been a challenge, which we used to uh, meet face to face a ton more, but we're doing so on Zoom. So every Friday we have kill, kill this. Let me every Friday we have a staff meeting. Sorry, guys, I'll turn this off. Um, and 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 that meeting is approximately an hour and a half in length. Um, we go over the entire Rolodex of customers that, that we talk about. Every single person's on an own individualized program, certainly sometimes more similarities and differences, but we want to know whether it's Kier that comes in, I, I need to know about Kier's back and whether Tom, Joe, Susie, I want Kier, the first thing out of his Melly Kier. Yeah, we talked about, you know, we talked about X, Y, Z in your staff meeting. I want to focus on making sure that we're going to do this, this, and this, this. So there's a, a message in those meetings. Um, we talk about um, certainly uh, uh, core values, uh, our, our business, uh, our business in terms and measures of uh, core competencies. Those are, uh, we have a book club, uh, that we focus on. So, uh, and last but not least, probably one of the most important things, uh, we have a, a situational awareness. So we have these, like, literally, as, as crazy as it sounds, like we will have, um, um, what do you, what do you call that kind of comedy? Sketch comedy, I guess, almost like you're, like, here, oh, here, improv. improv. Here, yeah. you know, here's a situation that we dealt with. You know, you, you've come in late 20 minutes and uh, take it away. And we'll critique those. We want to have really crisp communication uh, from a standpoint of our, our, um, our coaches. So we're speaking the same language, having the same voice and also being critiqued. Hey man, you know, that sucked. Or here's what I would say differently. And that includes me too. Um, so from a business standpoint, we want to go over and know our core competencies and core values. Um, and uh, from a, 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 a communication standpoint, so we do the improv. Uh, we have an, from an educational standpoint, we have book club. We also have what we call DSC University. So that our coaches have access to over, you know, probably 300 different resources, most of them books and CDs and DVDs. Um, uh, we have a, a, um, a, uh, a stipend for continuing education for our coaches. Um, and then last but not least, I think uh, hopefully to, to get a more cohesive group, um, we strive to do it at least once a month, at least go out for a beer with the guys, you know, talk about not strength training, but just BS. Um, but in terms of scalability, meetings, uh, in terms of processes and communication are big. Yeah. We used yeah. to do it with uh, road trips. We, yeah. like, we would take the interns on road trips. We, we almost killed one in New York once. <laughs> <laughs> I, we I'll, haven't I'll, done the, I'll send you the photos when we're off there. <laughs> uh, we, we, I haven't done the road trip, but uh, the beers with the boys is always fun. Tremendous. So um, where can people find you and where can they find the book? Oh yeah. Uh, just amazon.com would be great. Um, that, that would be uh, a place to find the book, uh, Twitter and Instagram, just Anthony Donscoff. Awesome. And we'll get that in the links. Thank yeah. you. All right, guys. Yeah.